So, um, Tony, you've transitioned now from what was valued at a $10.5 billion company in Onyx to a startup level company now called Humanity Therapeutics uh, here in Cambridge that, if my math is correct, uh, is currently valued at plus or minus approximately 1.5% of the value that you sold uh, Onyx for. So how's that working out for you? It's actually working out great. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's different. It's really different. It, you know, you go from a company that has nearly a thousand employees to one that I think we've got 26 today uh, at last count. Could be 28 by the end of the week. Uh, and so it's dramatically different. You do things you never thought you would do. I, I haven't read a lease in a long time, but, uh, but uh, it's reading leases, it's hiring uh, all of the essential people, and very importantly, hiring a, a really good uh, team uh, of leadership uh, in the company. Raising money's a bear. Uh, always, but, uh, but it's been terrific, and we've had some early success, and uh, things are, are actually in good shape. Speaking of reading leases, um, you've had the opportunity, as we heard in your in introduction, to go to school uh, and to work here in Massachusetts and in the, and in the Boston, Cambridge area at least a couple or, or three times, and for several years in the Bay Area at Onyx Pharmaceuticals, and I know that you, like so many of the people in this room, really enjoy the, the spontaneous interaction that occurs here in Cambridge because it is so compact versus the way um, it is out west. But I'm wondering if you're seeing anything here in the Boston, Cambridge area um, with the tremendous demand for and the cost of space, which I know, as you mentioned, you've been reading leases and that you had some challenges trying to find a place to domicile your company, the cost of living, the cost of doing business. GE is coming to town now. Silicon Valley's coming to town. IBM Watson uh, here in Cambridge, for example. Are you worried, are you seeing any signs that Massachusetts and Boston could go the way of San Francisco in terms of becoming just not friendly to your level of business? I don't think Massachusetts will ever become not friendly. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that. But I do see a couple of trends emerging that uh, I think bear watching. One of them is the absolute cost of real estate and cost of living, as well as the availability of real estate. I can tell you, having looked at this particular question in other parts of the country, in San Francisco and in New York as well, where everyone's trying to figure out a way to have a bioeconomy, um, there are a number of companies that are beginning to look outside of the Boston area, as successful as Boston has been because of the sheer price and availability of real estate. And I think that bears watching, not just in terms of new development opportunities for, for real estate developers, but also for the industry. Because to the extent that overhead, lease, and facilities uh, take up 10, 15, 20 percent of uh, an annual budget, that puts a significant strain on those precious dollars that really have to be going after research. And I think that's going to cause uh, other cities to potentially surpass Boston as an attractive opportunity. Interesting. We just heard Bob uh, recognizing a handful of those cities uh, before we started. Governor Baker was here yesterday, uh, Tony, saying that something needs to be done about pricing. And he suggested that perhaps the pay-for-performance uh, pilot program, if you will, that Novartis is doing with its relatively new uh, heart failure medicine called Entresto could be one of the ways uh, to go. So do you think, Tony, that that kind of pilot program could be successful in a more uh, broader acceptance throughout the industry, that it represents the future, or do you think it's just too soon to tell, or that there might be another way or other ways of addressing this? So th this is a really interesting topic. It's interesting for a couple of reasons. 25 years ago, when I started at Merck Pharmaceuticals, uh, Merck had an ACE inhibitor that was an innovative therapy at the time called enalapril. My first job at Merck Pharmaceuticals was to look at a risk sharing program for the reduction of heart failure hospitalizations for enalapril as a money back guarantee to manage care clients. That was 1992, so 23 years ago. So no and here we are today. And here we are today, but no one was ready for that particular innovation. Merck at the time was on the forefront of innovating in terms of sales force sizes, volume-based contracting with pharmaceutical, with uh, managed care organizations. 
So there was a lot happening to try to address the emerging conversation about controlling the cost of health care. And this was the early 1990s. So I could have just said all that and described 2016 in a way. So now we are come full circle in a way in terms of innovative pricing approaches. And, and so let, let's have that conversation because it's, it's on the lips of everyone. It's on the lips of the candidates running for president. It's on the lips of the governor of, uh, of our state. Uh, it's in our heads. Uh, it's been referenced uh, all over the place in the lay press. And if you think a little bit about how we might constructively address uh, pricing, I actually fundamentally believe that innovation will always be rewarded. So I think there's an opportunity to maintain the kinds of premium pricing structures that this industry has enjoyed and I believe deserves in, uh, in the context of a patent-based intellectual property protection society. However, one of the great things I learned at Merck is that timing is everything and there's an opportunity for us as an industry to step up and think creatively about how we address these, these, uh, these conversations. So Novartis has done just that and if I, the way I think about it is in terms of We've got a variety of innovative pricing approaches. I, I don't know if this is where you wanted to go, but this, yes. is, this is what I want to give Take you. Take it wherever you want. Uh, because there are a variety of uh, potential approaches. There's the very simple cost plus pricing approach. You take your cost, you add a, a fixed margin on top of that, and that's your pharmaceutical price. Very simple, very straightforward. Probably works in commodity-based markets. Doesn't work for pharmaceuticals. You have the outcomes-based approaches, and if you think about value-based pricing, and there's been a lot of conversation about value-based pricing uh, over the last two days here or so, there's a simple correlation between whether there's an efficacy endpoint, an improvement in life, or, or an improvement in mortality, as well as a reduction in hospitalizations or other valuable endpoints, so clinical outcome related. But then there's the pay for performance aspect, and there's something compelling about that particular approach. So in Tresto, you mentioned, uh, gives an, a, pro, Novartis provides a rebate for Entresto, which has a remarkable <coughs> reduction uh, uh, in death or an improvement in mortality, 20% or so, I think, compared to standard of care. And if the overall system savings, including hospitalizations, from the two providers we've contracted with so far, Cigna and Aetna, goes down, then the rebates uh, go up, meaning that more money comes back to Novartis. If hospitalizations and system savings go the other direction, then Novartis is the beneficiary. And I think there's something very compelling about that kind of approach that we should step up and really analyze. Speaking, though, as you just mentioned, what's on the lips of politicians these days, another Senate hearing on pricing is scheduled for later this month. I read this week that Michael Pearson has once again been asked uh, to testify on Capitol Hill there. At least one presidential candidate is campaigning and constantly promising, and I'm quoting now, um, to go after the pharmaceutical companies. And another candidate is running a TV campaign commercial um, holding up Valiant uh, as the poster child or whipping boy, if you will, of drug pricing run amok. All this against the backdrop of he who shall not be named, initials uh, MS. Uh, do you think that the current socio-political environment over the long term is going to do real harm to the life sciences sector? Or do you think, as some have suggested, that this is just stereotypical, populist, amped up election year rhetoric? I think it is going to impact and change the industry. You know, we, we are in a state of constant evolution. It's just the nature of humankind. So the, the rhetoric, the attention, the contention sometimes that surrounds the industry is undoubtedly going to, to change us. In a way, like a refiner's fire. You, know, you, you, you heat something very high, you're able to mold it and, and shape it. So if we think over the next 30 or 40 years, will the pharmaceutical or healthcare industry look the way it does today? Probably not. But I might challenge the notion and say, should it? because we've just, we've just, Rachel's talked a little bit about the, the great innovation from the Affordable Care Act and what that's brought us. And times are changing. So we as an industry have to adopt and have to change with that. So we shouldn't necessarily view the, the contentious debate that's happening right now as the death knell of what is one of America's greatest industries. It's an opportunity for us to shape and reshape ourselves in the right way. 
Tony, I want to pick up on another thread that you mentioned just a few minutes ago, and that is your experience at Big Pharma, um, and it was mentioned uh, in Bob's introduction as well. Um, big Pharma, quote unquote, is often mentioned in the pejorative by a lot of people in a lot of circles. But more and more startup level CEOs and executives like yourself are either coming out of the major pharmaceutical companies or like you, they have their career roots at the major pharmaceutical companies. So is there something or things that you appreciate most that you took from Bristol and you took from Merck that have really helped you, not just now in the running of a baby uh, biopharmaceutical company, but also at a mid-sized company like Onyx? Uh, th there's one from each of them that, uh, that comes immediately to mind. Uh, Merck taught me excellence. It's really interesting. You know, all of my life I've, I've focused on being a physician, being the best physician I could be, you know, being a part of the greatest institutions that, that one can be a part of. But when I arrived at Merck, there was something in the DNA of that company that did a couple of things. Excuse me, this was Roy Vagelos? This, this was Roy Vagelos, was the CEO. One of the, one of the greatest leaders uh, of our industry of all time. Uh, still alive, still doing well, still doing great things, and a personal mentor of, of mine. But it taught me two things. It taught me the, to be, that the attention to detail and the focus on excellence in everything you do in this industry is critical. And that if we lead with science and we follow by doing the right thing, and I can give a couple of examples of what that looks like, then we will always profit. So think about a physician who's changed careers and having that as the foundation for your early career experience. I, I, it, it doesn't get a lot better in terms of training for how you really emerge as a leader in the industry. Bristol Myers Squibb taught me something very different. It wasn't number one. Merck had been, when I joined, had been the most admired, admired company uh, by Fortune for seven years running. So you can see the, the notoriety it gained as a result of the excellence. Bristol Myers Group wasn't number one, but it taught me the intense, fierce, competitive spirit that's required for us to continue to push the envelope and ask the most important questions. Because the mantra at BMS was, we want to be number one. And it was interesting to operate in our industry, which is so ethically oriented and with such a, a, a moral high road in most cases. And we can, we can talk about some more contemporary examples that, that I've got lots of views about. But um, taking the high road and using that high road, using the ethical approach, and really intensely and fiercely going after those things that will bring the greatest benefit to patients. So that's one of your aspirations, obviously, at your new company, Humanity Therapeutics, where you're focused among other things, but primarily, let's say, on Alzheimer's disease at the moment, um, where the cost of the medicine, should you and hopefully other companies, some of them in this room, are going to be successful at, is only going to be one small part of that equation. So this week, I don't know if any of you are aware, the Alzheimer's Association came out with a new survey of 3,500 adults in this country affected by the disease, and it is getting a massive amount of attention because the data show a very sad, scary, and sobering picture. So for example, two of the data points, 30% of caregivers, in particular, when it comes to the personal and financial burden, are eating less or are going hungry. And one out of five caregivers is cutting back on their own health care. Now, as everybody knows, we just lost probably the most famous, um, and at least at one point, the most outspoken Alzheimer's disease caregiver in Nancy Reagan. So Tony, what could or should be done to ensure that, that, that the current sorry state of affairs is evidenced by this new survey is not her legacy, number one, and also is not our fate as a society and a country? I think the, 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 the best thing we can do is race forward with finding disease-modifying therapies. Because at the end of the day, and that's going to take some time, but at the end of the day, if we can change the course of these terrible diseases, and this one in particular, we'll be able to sidestep or prevent, if not reduce, if not prevent, some of the consequences you're, you're talking about. CBS Evening News last, last night featured a, a couple, very, very touching story about a 73-year-old man who is, and some of you probably saw it, who, who cannot retire 
because if he retires, he won't have an income, and he is the primary caregiver for his wife who suffered with Alzheimer's for the last eight years or so. Now, if we could change the course of her disease, if we could improve the quality of life, if we could extend the preservation of her cognitive function and her memory, they'd have a different life together. They'd be cruising around the world. They'd be doing all sorts of things, not worried about how a 73-year-old man is going to care for his wife. Yeah, and if you want to see that story, obviously the, the newscast already aired, but I'm sure it's on CBS, if you go to Google CBS Evening News uh, website, it's just a couple minutes of your time. All right, so let's, let's cut to the chase. What, Tony Coles, is a fair, acceptable, sustainable, justifiable, appropriate profit margin for life sciences companies, for their boards of directors, for their investors? In other words, you talked about the need for new pricing models and approaches. Are they really going to be willing to adapt and accept a new system like that that is potentially going to put a cap on their returns and on shareholder value? In a hypothetical scenario, is the CEO going to be able to keep her or his job if they were to take that kind of bold step? Do you want a number? Uh, you can answer it however you want to answer it. So. You know, I, I, I think, Mike, uh, you know, I, I view it this way, and this is why I, I started our conversation with the Merck example, because one of the great, great things that Merck did at the time under Roy's leadership was to recognize that times were changing and that we were evolving as an industry and that it was important for companies to get ahead of this and to, in a sense, self-regulate. You know, we, we did this as an industry for a couple of decades in terms of what we used to call pharmacogenomics and personalized medicine, now is known as precision medicine. We shunted it into a corner, looked the other way, and said it will go away one day because we don't necessarily want to have to target our therapies that specifically because we make all this money through injudicious use in, in patients who may not deserve it. That's, that's telling the truth inside. Because these were all the conversations that happened all, all the time. We buried our head in the sand and we lost two decades of knowledge, information, and opportunity to really leverage what was inevitable and logical in terms of the application of precision-based medicine. Is that because everybody was fat and happy? That's because we didn't have to be hungry in a way. And so on that basis, uh, I, I think we allowed these things to, to just, almost like an ostrich in its sand, head in the sand, we could ignore those things. Well, here we are 20 years later, science has advanced so rapidly that we can no longer ignore, ignore it, and we're finally doing what we should have done as an industry two decades or so ago. I think pricing's the same way, and I think the business model question is the exact same question. And if we choose to put our head in the sand, and ignore the fact that innovations require it not just in science and in the diseases we go after, but also in the way we model our business and in the way that we deliver returns to shareholders, then we'll miss an opportunity. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that we walk away from a business model that is supported by the capitalist business model in this country. It's been a great engine of innovation for our business and for many others. But I also don't think we should be isolated as an industry and accept it from delivering superior returns to shareholders. So if you hold that as a truism, you also have to hold out the prospect that we have to innovate so we can continue to deliver returns to shareholders and at the same time benefit patients. And I, for one, happen to believe you can do all three. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned just a moment ago precision medicine. As was mentioned by Bob in your introduction, you are on the NIH working group, part of it uh, with the Precision Medicine Initiative. Uh, the Moonshots program has been mentioned several times this morning uh, and this afternoon by Rachel. Regardless of who's in the White House at this time next year, do you think that these programs survive into a new administration, Republican or Democrat, or maybe even independent? Um, and if so, what does the next phase look like for both of these programs? What should be the goals and action items as they grow? So let's start with the, the moonshot, because the moonshot is a wonderful renaissance or rebirth of the war on cancer that was started in the late 1960s and early by 70s. By Nixon. So, and by Nixon. 
So we are in the evolution, back to that theme, or the next chapter, or the next two or three chapters of that war on cancer that was begun where we've made an incredible amount of progress. Mortality rates from breast cancer are falling, mortality rates from several other cancers are falling. First meaningful interventions in melanoma that I've seen in my entire career, both as physician and business executive. So that clarion call to action is yielding results and yielding benefits. Now, will it exist as the moonshot if uh, in the next administration? I don't know. But will we ever take our eye off the ball of improving the prospects for survival of patients who have cancer? No. I think it's squarely in our crosshairs, and I feel the same way about Alzheimer's. Now, precision medicine, very interesting. Very interesting difference that there was bipartisan support for uh, for the Precision Medicine Initiative, which is one of the things that allowed it to be funded, uh, funded in the appropriation for this year, with the understanding, implicit as it is, because there's no entitlement here, that it would be reallocated and reappropriated for subsequent years. I can tell you the $300 million that were allocated for this initiative for its first year will be insufficient to get started, because it's a million-person cohort trial with the collection of samples, biobanking, and long-term follow-up on the basis of genomic profiles, disease incidents, and then outcomes. And you don't do that for 300 million for 1 million people in this country. So I suspect there will continue to be, because of the bipartisan support, sustained support and uh, continued existence of the Precision Medicine Initiative. So very different. All right, so I'll throw you a curveball then. Okay. All right. I, I know you really enjoy working in this industry, um, but you're kind of straddling now um, federal government as well and policy and um, uh, public affairs and things like that. Ever want to run for office? I love the job I have now. <laughs> <laughs> and, Good uh, answer. Uh, no, I, I do. I, I really do love the job I have now. Um, I think that, you know, we have to... One of the reasons I love humanity, and I, I, will, I will want to come back to the, the answer because there's something important in this. One of the things I love about running humanity is I can't imagine a better scientific platform for some of the most challenging diseases that we face as humankind, not just in America, as, as a globe or as the world. Nearly 50 million people affected by these diseases worldwide at a cost of nearly a trillion dollars and, and all that's climbing. So all the indicators suggest we've got to do something. I love a challenge like that. I've, I've said this before. I, uh, that I love a good, meaty problem like that. So I'm, I'm having great fun there. However, I do think people who are thoughtful, who are insightful, who take a broad view, really have a responsibility to step up and serve in broader ways. That doesn't mean you have to run for office. It doesn't mean that you have to even go to Washington. It means that locally, wherever we are, we can make an important difference. So whether it's occasions like this, whether it's, it's being anywhere you are to make a difference in this particular industry, I think we all have a, a leadership responsibility because at the end of the day, we're making a big difference in the lives of people. Tony, if you could say abracadabra or take this $4.99 magic wand. <laughs> Did you just pull that, that out of your yes, pocket? Yes, I did, like <laughs> magic, um, that I purchased on Amazon for $4.99. Does uh, it collapse? I mean, it's no, it's, it's $4.99. So you won't uh, <laughs> <it. laughs> uh, If you could tap it or wave it uh, to fix the problem or problems that affect the people in this room uh, or that fix the problems facing the people that everybody in this room is trying to help or fixes the problems when it comes to ensuring healthy returns for all of these people's uh, investors, what would that problem or problems be that you'd want to use this wand for? I would say to get us off the defensive. I think as an industry for a long time, we have been framed, positioned, shaped by other stakeholders in the value equation or, or in the healthcare conversation. And I think as a result of that, and we all know this, when someone else positions you, you're always reacting and you're always on the defensive. And I think that's what we're doing as an industry. I think we have an opportunity to step up and to very loudly proclaim 
and proudly proclaim, we are in one of the greatest industries on earth. We make a difference in the lives of people. We drive economic innovation. We drive an important part of the GDP of this country. And, and we have nothing to be embarrassed or ashamed about. We, you know, we have the, the, the lowest or the highest negative rating of all industries except for tobacco. How does that happen? Because of MS, Mr. M period, S period, uh, and his and Well, his and, 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 and there, and this is not an ad hominem comment, I think we also have to stand up and say, you, sir, are an embarrassment. And you, sir, don't represent the values of what this industry is capable of and should be focused on. And to do that quickly and without hesitation. Because to the extent that we allow that phenomenon to exist in any form, whenever it, the question is called, it reflects poorly on us. And it's part of our being defensive. So I would put us on the offensive, and I'd, I'd drive us forward very, very aggressively with everything that we all know and love about this industry. All right. Um, at the risk of bringing up thoughts in everybody's head of an event that happened this week involving this uh, cable TV news host, um, I'd like to wrap things up, Tony, by putting out an open-ended question. It's actually a statement, really, that Mr. Chris Matthews likes to end his show with. And that is, Tony, and I'm paraphrasing or tweaking this ever so slightly, Tell us something we don't know. Hmm. Here's okay. a thought. <laughs> I think no matter who sits in the White House come January of 2017, the worry and the, the consternation we've had about the pricing conversation will not be as bad as we're expecting. I think we're expecting a chicken little phenomenon that the, the sky's really falling. And I suspect that if it's Hillary Clinton, she will pivot to the center and she will focus very clearly. This is just one man's opinion. She'll focus very clearly on some of the bad actors, some of the extremists in the industry, and those where the intent to gain profit has outstripped the potential benefit for individuals. I think that's where the focus will be. If we have a Republican president, and, and I, it's been, this has been so unpredictable that it's hard to, t to say, but I suspect that there will be a clear recognition that this industry drives important economic change. And the rhetoric that we've heard will tone down. And if there's anything legislatively or regu regulatorily related to this, that it will be appropriately focused on either driving innovation that could be value-based or performance-based, or very specifically focused on the most egregious examples of profiteering in this industry. Please um, join me in thanking the ever thought-provoking, the ever articulate, the ever smart um, and insightful Dr. Tony Coles.